Throughout the long history of DC Comics, there have been many weird, embarrassing, or just plain sketchy things that they've tried to keep secret. At this point, you may be asking, like what? Well, stuff like this. Back in 1984, DC Comics wasn't doing so hot. While Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman merchandise always sold big, the comic books themselves were scraping rock bottom according to comicbook.com. Meanwhile, Marvel was making bank at the time, so DC's parent company, Warner Brothers, proposed the idea of selling their comic book subsidiary to Marvel. According to Geek Tyrant, Marvel's president initially rejected the sale. He decided that if DC's sales sucked, it was because its characters sucked. Famed Marvel editor Jim Shooter was shocked by this decision, so he swooped in and begged the president to reconsider, pointing out that DC's poor sales were due to bad writing, not bad characters. Shooter proposed introducing the heroes to the Marvel Universe with seven starting titles – Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Teen Titans, Justice League, and the Legion of Superheroes. But in the end, what killed the buyout wasn't an alien invasion, a magic spell, or an asteroid, but corporate politics. Marvel's potential comic book marketplace dominance veered a bit too close to violating antitrust laws, and everyone went their separate ways. These days, Shazam is a DC superhero, headlining a multi-million dollar blockbuster. The way he got there was not so heroic. When Superman first hit newsstands in 1938, every publisher in the nation suddenly wanted its own superhero. One of the early successes, which came out only months after Superman's debut, was Billy Batson, a young boy who uttered the word Shazam to become full-grown powerhouse Captain Marvel. Batson's stories were published by Fawcett Comics, and as Newsarama points out, comics starring the Big Red Cheese not only outsold Superman, but also inspired the first live-action superhero adaptation ever. Shazam! DC sued Fawcett, alleging that Captain Marvel was a Superman ripoff. Fawcett won the case in 1951, but DC appealed, winning a retrial in 1952. Fawcett probably could have given it another go, but superhero comic sales had dropped off by that time, so they gave up. The name Captain Marvel got scooped up by Marvel Comics in the 1960s, according to Gizmodo, while the Batson character languished until 1972, when the rights were bought by none other than DC Comics, which eventually renamed him Shazam to avoid its own copyright clash with Marvel. Most media forums have a history of mirroring the United States culture of racism. The comics industry has sometimes been ahead of its time, considering that the entire superhero genre was the brainchild of Jewish creators striking out against Nazis. Comics have often tried to fight prejudiced attitudes. Sadly, though, there have been numerous occasions where outdated cultural attitudes toward minority groups have poisoned comics, DC included. Many of the propaganda covers DC published during World War II included cartoonishly racist depictions of Japanese people. DC later developed more than a few characters comic book creators likely wish you'd forget, including Egg Fu, an oval-shaped Asian stereotype, and ex a gay stereotype. But some of the publisher's sketchy relationship with race isn't quite so obvious. For example, how about Green Lantern's longtime sidekick, Tom Kalmaku? Of Inuit descent, you might wonder how Green Lantern's airplane mechanic chum might be considered racist. Well, how about the fact that in the first few decades of the character's existence, his official nickname was Pie Face, a term that's widely considered as a slur against anyone who has Asian-looking features? In recent years, DC has made sure that any time Tom shows up in the comics, his nickname doesn't. But it's a pretty bad look for one of your flagship heroes to call his best friend a racist name for years. While a lot of recent focus has centered on Hollywood, just about every industry has some history with the sexual harassment, abuse, and problematic power dynamics women have struggled against for centuries. Comics are no exception, and perhaps the most noteworthy figure to receive promotions despite a known history of sexual abuse is former DC editor Eddie Berganza. According to Vox, the long entangled trail of allegations against Berganza was largely swept aside for years. By the time Berganza became executive editor in 2010, allegedly any female DC staffers who reported his actions to HR were removed, leading to even more female creators avoiding DC Comics. By 2012, an incident involving Berganza at WonderCon was criticized by enough people that DC demoted him to the still prominent position of group editor of the Superman titles. In 2017, BuzzFeed reported that multiple women were still coming forth with sexual assault allegations against Berganza. 
That's when the company finally fired Berganza after an internal review. The Times of Israel told the tale of two nerdy young men named Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, who had the grand idea of a story about an alien baby doomed to death being rocketed to Earth where his amazing powers and moral resolve would make him the world's champion. It's one of the most influential ideas in American culture, but when DC Comics agreed to print their story in the late 1930s, Siegel and Schuster had no idea how valuable it really was. So they sold all the rights for Superman to DC Comics for a paltry $130. Decades later, as DC profited from cartoons, toys, and blockbuster films, Schuster and Siegel faced eviction threats and medical debt. Though both men did eventually make some money from their creation, it certainly wasn't their fair share. According to Ars Technica, the duo first sued the comics company all the way back in 1947, reaching a settlement that earned them royalty payments that continued throughout their lives and credit for the hero's creation. The legal battles didn't die with them, though. In the 2000s, their families mounted another legal battle, arguing that a 1978 change in copyright law should give them more rights over the character. After years in court, DC Warner Brothers won the case in 2014. Most people with a passing knowledge of comics would say Bob Kane created Batman. But as Fast Company points out, that's not the whole truth. While Kane certainly came up with the name Batman, his original concept of a red-shirted, domino-masked blonde man with real bat wings was dramatically different from the final product refined by Bill Finger, who really deserves a huge amount of credit. According to Wired, Finger created most of the iconic elements of the Dark Knight, including his wealthy alter ego Bruce Wayne, his origin story, Gotham City, and many of the major villains including Joker, Penguin, and Catwoman. Bill reconstructed Batman into the Batman that we all know today. Yet Kane took all the credit, with a particularly notorious example being the creator's self-aggrandizing tombstone, which refers to Batman as a Hand of God creation that was divinely bestowed upon him. In recent years, Finger's name has finally started popping up in Batman films, comics, and media, but that doesn't excuse DC's long history of giving Kane all the credit. Nobody saw Superman coming, or could have foreseen how meager that $130 payment would someday seem. Watchmen, on the other hand? That happened in the 1980s, and what DC did to the book's creators doesn't sit well with some. According to writer Alan Moore, when he and artist Dave Gibbons first crafted the series, the publisher presented themselves as a new DC Comics and offered a deal. Once Watchmen went out of print, the rights would revert back to the creators. Moore and Gibbons enthusiastically signed the dotted line, but DC had another plan in mind. The publisher has ensured that Watchmen has never gone out of print. Back at that time, there was no such thing as a comic that remained in print for longer than six months. Moore also claims DC attempted to blackmail him by employing and then firing a friend with a dying brother to remain quietly compliant about new Watchmen-related works. Moore would have preferred to publicly denounce those projects. Though Moore will forever be remembered for writing some of DC's most iconic works, it's no surprise that he's refused to ever work for the company again. And that's not even the only time Moore has clashed with DC Comics. There are a lot of great Batman stories out there, but The Killing Joke by Alan Moore and Brian Bolland is often considered the definitive Joker tale. Most Batman writers in any medium hail the story. One author who isn't a fan, though, is Alan Moore himself, according to Inverse. Moore now believes the story he wrote was far too gruesome, weighty, provocative, and violent for a quote, simplistic comic book character like Batman. He regards the whole thing as a terrible misstep. Although Moore wrote dark stories including Watchmen and the more adult take on Shazam called Miracle Man, he claims he never intended for other comic writers to follow his lead. Though Moore admits to no longer having any interest in Batman, he does say if he were to approach the Caped Crusader today, he would prefer to write the colorful, smiling version of Batman. Moore has said several times that he's not even a fan of the superhero genre anymore, according to Sci-Fi. Even still, Moore's dislike for his own story doesn't change The Killing Joke's immense impact on popular culture, particularly in regard to inspiring Heath Ledger's performance in The Dark Knight. Wonder Woman is one of the most inspirational superheroes around. Feminist philosophy played a key role in her creation, and she's been a symbol of empowerment for three quarters of a century. She's only become more popular since the 2017 film starring Gal Gadot. Now that Diana Prince is bigger than ever, DC is probably glad it didn't publish the weird Wonder Woman bondage comic Frank Miller wanted to write in his post-Dark Knight Strikes Again days. The only material ever developed for the project involved a number of rather exploitative drawings of the heroine. 
According to comic book resources, Miller had discussions with DC editor Bob Schreck about the project, which would have re-envisioned Diana and her origin in an adult-oriented way. The character's creator, William Moulton Marston, was a radical feminist who liked that sort of thing as a metaphor for the many ways in which women were collectively and individually constrained by law and tied down by marriage, domesticity, children, and all the rest of it. Given how easily that message could be misinterpreted, it's probably a good thing that DC stayed away from the project. The 1992 story The Death of Superman is a sprawling epic that shows the Man of Steel perishing against a monstrous foe named Doomsday, followed by a mad scramble for inheritors to claim his legacy. It has become one of the all-time classic Kal-El stories to date. The reason it all happened, though, is pretty nuts. As Sci-Fi explains, the 90s weren't a good time for Superman sales. The inspirational Kryptonian hero languished against darker, flashier rebels such as Wolverine and the Punisher. DC's Superman line needed a big event, so they decided to finally have Clark Kent and Lois Lane get hitched. But right before the couple could say I do, the TV series Lois and Clark The New Adventures of Superman came out, putting a heavy focus on the romance and making it seem unwise to make the simmering soap opera heroes from TV happily married in the comics. So the wedding was postponed, and the Superman writers needed a new, massive event to fill the empty space. Writer Jerry Ordway allegedly joked, let's kill him, and suddenly, comics history was forever changed. In 2013, DC issued an open talent search by which unknown artists could submit illustrations based on a prompt for a chance to draw one page of an upcoming Harley Quinn comic, according to Newsarama. It seemed like an awesome opportunity, but there was a problem. The prompt asked submitters to draw a picture of Harley lying naked in a bathtub and humorously considering various methods of self-harm. Not surprisingly, this combination of self-inflicted injury and titillation didn't sit well with the American Psychiatric Association. DC quickly backtracked, claiming the page description was taken out of context and was not intended to make light of a serious situation. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.